Good to see each and every one of you here today. Pray for those that are traveling with this Labor Day holiday, but we are so thankful that you're here. And I want us to grab our Bibles today. We're going to take a look at two uh, pieces of scripture today. The title of my message is Get Some Rest. Oh, man. Look at the revival's already started. This is great. Get some rest. I, uh, I, I want to take a look at, uh, uh, at a picture of Jesus that a lot of times we don't, we don't really grasp. Uh, we see him as the healer, the great preacher, teacher. We see him as, you know, casting out devils and, uh, and uh, walking on water. Uh, but I would dare say that nobody has ever uh, tried to go into uh, a, a Christian bookstore. <laughs> I don't even know if they have those anymore. Uh, and, and say, hey, do, do you have any pictures of Jesus tired? You got any pictures of Jesus where he just needs a nap? And, and I want to show you today that even your Savior was tired. And the kind of tired I'm talking about is not because uh, you stayed up late watching college football last night and now you're kind of dragging. By the way, speaking of college football, how about the revival taking place at Ohio State University right now? Isn't that amazing? And uh, I guess there were some that were going to make the sign of the cross there, but they were afraid that Michigan would have stole that sign too. Uh, But... uh, That was really good. So, some of you don't know. Anyway. But, uh, so I'm not talking about whether you need a nap or not today. Uh, I, I want to go a little bit deeper than that and, uh, and really talk about those times that we're just fatigued and, uh, and what causes that and where we can find help. So we're going to start in John chapter 4 today. And if you would, uh, if you're able to, would you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this together? John chapter 4, just going to read six verses here today. Here's what it says. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria named Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. Now, uh, why don't you turn with me or click with me to Matthew chapter 11. Uh, So uh, we had... Two verses today for the price of one. Isn't that great? So two texts, and uh, we will not charge you double to be here. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. A lot of you will recognize this. Jesus says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So Jesus, I pray that you would be that source of strength that we, that we need, whether that be emotional, mental, spiritual, or even physical. Lord, I ask you that you would meet us right where we're at today, and... Uh, Lord, that you would know, uh, that we would know that you are here to restore our souls. And so, have your way across this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Get some rest. Get some rest. So this might be a crazy revelation to you. But Jesus, who was 100% God, but also 100% man while he was on earth, felt feelings like we feel and went through things like we do and yet did not have any sin whatsoever. But part of his humanity mixed with his divinity was moments where he felt tired. Uh, In fact, it's fair to say Jesus might have been a pretty hard sleeper 
if you remember, he was in the boat sleeping while there was a huge storm going on. So, oh, to be able to sleep that hard. Uh, but for some of us in here, and again, I'm not talking about uh, whether you only got five hours of sleep or less last night. I'm not talking about how you want your Sunday nap. Fine. But I want to talk about a fatigue that tends to be a little deeper than that. Where it kind of wears us down, we feel worn down. We feel worn out for different reasons. In fact, I'm going to explore some of those reasons today. And this is not just confined to the uh, older people in here, however we will define that. And it also includes those of you who are younger as well. Uh, what I'm about to share with you, all of this can apply to our lives where we desperately need Jesus to help us get some emotional, mental, spiritual, and maybe even physical rest. So, let's give you two, two points today, okay? 28 sub-points, but two points. So here we go. Uh, number one, let's look at the source of our fatigue. The source of our fatigue. What makes us tired? What wears us down? Uh, I think it's more than just working 40 hours a week. I think it's more than, than, than uh, you know, you did some yard work yesterday and now you're beat. Let's go deeper. In fact, let's take a look and see what Jesus himself was going through. And maybe we could relate a little bit more to this subject here today on this Labor Day weekend about truly getting some rest. Here's the first thing that I've noticed that can wear us down. Uh, number one, trouble. Trouble. With a capital T? No, I won't. Some of you know that Broadway song, but I won't, I won't sing it now because it's not the time. Um, trouble. Jesus was facing some trouble, some opposition. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. You know what was interesting? Jesus... And, and I'm going to set the stage right now. Jesus did nothing wrong, okay? Can, can we make sure that we know this, okay? He was sinless, okay? And, and so there's nothing that Jesus messed up that made him tired, okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this right now. All of this happens to us. And sometimes, how many of you know, trouble and opposition happens to us. Here's Jesus doing some good things. He is preaching about the kingdom of God. And more people are getting baptized under his ministry than there were getting baptized by John the Baptist. And you would think that the people, especially the religious people, would be thrilled with that. Oh, no. Oh, no. The Pharisees. Always, always not liking anything Jesus did whatsoever. Church, may I tell you, whenever you do anything effective for the kingdom of God, there is always a Pharisee somewhere ready to criticize that thing, ready to make trouble for you, ready to put you down, ready to give their opinion uh, like their opinion is the most important. And, and, and here's Jesus just doing his father's work, and he's got trouble. He's got opposition. You've been there? Maybe you're there now. You're just trying to do what God wants you to do. And what happens? There, there's opposition. That might come in the form of spiritual opposition, and then sometimes that'll flesh out with some people that uh, are... How many of you know there are some people that are really, really good at being used by the devil, uh, to, to try to discourage the work of God. Maybe you don't know that. Uh, and, and, and some of them can be kind of religious. When we face opposition from the enemy of our souls, 
I can tell you that'll wear you down. That, that'll make you tired. Secondly, not only was there trouble, but there was also a triumph. There were some victories that Jesus was experiencing here. Again, we just read verses 1 and 2, but look at it again. Jesus is actually baptizing more people than John the Baptist was, except Jesus isn't even the one that's doing the actual baptizing. He's actually commissioning his disciples to do it. So on, on, as far as ministry goes, this is pretty good. Jesus is experiencing some victories. But I will tell you as a pastor who has now been here almost 24 years, victorious times and times of mountaintops can be very tiring. A lot of us think that the stress and a lot of us think that the fatigue only comes when we're at a low point. And trust me, that's there. <laughs> but fatigue and feeling worn down can also take place when you are seeing God use you in a great way. That can wear you out. You know, can I remind you, by the way, that after, after God created everything, he even took the seventh day to rest. Those of us who think that we don't need rest, and those of you who are ready to check out of this message because you don't think you need any rest whatsoever, I would dare say that you should look at God's example. You know, it's wonderful to be fruitful in ministry. Don't get me wrong. But it could be tiring. That's why you need to pray for your pastor and his family. That's why you need to pray for the staff of this church. Because doing God's work, it can get tiring. Very tiring. We work with the most combustible product in the world. Not nitroglycerin. Not gunpowder. People. Church people. Matter of fact. And y'all can be a little combustible. And we love you. We love you like crazy. But sometimes it, it, can, it can really wear on you when you're doing God's work. Here's the third thing that can make us a little worn out. Transition. <laughs> Trouble, triumph, transition. Change. How many of you love Change. It's been said that the only people who like change are babies with wet diapers. <laughs> and even they have a problem with it while it's being dealt with, right? Uh, look at verse 3. It says, so he left Judea and he went back once more to Galilee. So, so check this, okay? Jesus is having success. There's some opposition and he uses that as a reason now to kind of pull up the tent stakes and transition to a whole different location altogether. Jesus decided to make a change. In fact, I will tell you that Jesus made, you ready for this? Jesus made a very abrupt change. You know what can really wear some of us down is abrupt changes in our lives. And that can look so many different ways. For some of you, there's been a change in your job or in your career. Uh, a move forward, maybe a move backwards, maybe a lateral move, but change, it could be tough. Maybe there's been a change as you're trying to uh, help raise your grandkids or raise your own kids. Uh, students, maybe there's been a change as you find yourself on the campus this year, and it's a little different than it was last year. Change, transition, moving, uh, maybe going some other direction that God is calling you to go. Change can be tiring. I don't like change. I don't. I hate it. You've heard me say this before, or was it my therapist? Might have been both. But as a child, I used to cry when I'd get new Christmas toys, because I like the old toys. I'd grow out of my shoes. 
Mom would buy me new shoes. I don't want the new shoes. I want to cram my toes into the old shoes. Why? Because I don't like change. And so that, that, so I've been wired this way. It was my therapist. It, it, it's, so I've been, I've been wired this way for a long time. And so when change, abrupt change, especially when that comes, man, I'll be, I'll be a little vulnerable with you and tell you that that could just mess me up. That could wear me down quite a bit. And maybe you've had an abrupt change in your life recently. And right now you're experiencing some of the emotion that comes with that. And the mental fatigue that comes with that. Maybe it's been a good change. Uh, you know, young couples, when God blesses you with a child, that's a change. A good change. It'll half kill you, but it's a change. Good changes, bad changes, they all can wear us down. Fourthly, trust. This usually goes along with making changes. Where you have to trust God when you find yourself... When you find yourself doing something you've never done before. When you find yourself doing something you normally wouldn't do. Where do I get this? Take a look at verse 4. Now, he had to go through Samaria. Now, some of you read that, you're thinking, okay, big whoop. But this is kind of a big deal. Uh, Jesus was Jewish. Did you all know that? Okay. His disciples were Jewish. The opposite of a Jew was a Gentile. Okay? Jews and Gentiles didn't like each other. They didn't get along. Not at all. But then you had the Samaritans where they were a hybrid of the Jews and the Gentiles. So they were half Jewish, half Gentile. Nobody liked them. Not at all. And it was one thing for Jewish people to have a problem being around Gentiles, but it was another thing for them to be around Samaritans. That's why, by the way, that whole parable about the Good Samaritan is so radical. Because the last person on earth that should have helped that poor Jewish man who was beat up and robbed should have been a Samaritan. But that's another sermon altogether. So Jews normally would go, you ready for this? They go around Samaria. Through. They would avoid Samaria, through. Jesus went to a place that most Jewish men would never, ever go to. Jesus was directed by his father to go someplace that is not normal. Don't miss this. See, some of you, God is dealing with you to do something and go somewhere spiritually that you've never gone to or through before. And you've got it in your head, I can't do that. I can't go that way. People, I, I can't be used in that direction. Lord, no, I can't tell people about Jesus. No, I, I, I can't do this. Lord, no, 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 no. I can't do this ministry. I'm so Ill, ill-equipped. I'm so unqualified. And, and God says, I want you to go through your Samaria. I want you to go someplace that most people like you would never go. Where your only response is, God, okay, God, I trust you. When God says, I want you to take this career path that maybe nobody else would ever take, or I want you to say no to something that maybe everybody else would say yes to. Samaria. 
And you know what? That's tiring. Do you actually think that a guy like Peter did not speak up and say, what are we going to Samaria for? I don't like Samaria. James and John, sons of thunder. Oh, I'm mad because I'm going through Samaria. Thomas, I doubt it, but we might as well just go. So believe me, Jesus was probably hearing about it all the way there. And how much do we trust the Lord even when nobody else agrees? But we know it was from God. That could be tiring. Can I give you one more source? Just the trip. Thank you. Just the trip. Just the trip itself. Just life itself. Again, verses 5 and 6. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. Now, for those of us who might know this story, we know that this leads to Jesus talking to the woman at the well. God uses that conversation as a catalyst to touch all of Samaria because of this one chance encounter, chance encounter that Jesus has with a woman with a real sketchy past. Another story altogether. But when you are used of by the Lord and you're just trying to obey God and you're going through life and you've got your kids and you've got your schedule and you've got your job and you've got the stuff you got to do around the house and you've got all this that you're dealing with and all that that you're dealing with, how many of you know that that trip that we call life can be very very exhausting. And there's nobody in this place that knows that better than Jesus. Even Jesus was tired from this trip. Even Jesus found himself at a place of fatigue. What do you do? What do you do when you find yourself emotionally, mentally, spiritually, every way, any way, exhausted and fatigued. I want to show you. I'm going to close with this. No, I'm not. I'm just going to go to the second point. Uh, No, very quickly, let's look at the solution. If you're worn out today, I want to take you back to the words from Matthew chapter 11. What Jesus had to say to weary people, burdened people, people who were stressed, people who were exhausted, people who were fatigued, people who did nothing wrong. Look what he says. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can I give you a few steps today to follow? If you're exhausted, check this out. Number one is your reaction. Come to me, Jesus says. Come to me. Again, that's what, exactly what he said in verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to Don't go somewhere else to find rest. Don't go into the arms, ladies, of the first guy that burps in your face and think you're you're found your prince charming. Don't try to jump to this or that, that. First and foremost, go to Jesus. Your first reaction should be, Lord, I'm going to come to you. This is a hugely important command that the Lord gives. When you're feeling worn out, you got to come closer to the Lord. And here's the deal. A lot of people will use this occasion of being exhausted as an excuse to draw away from the Lord. Can I say that again? Because maybe some of you have made that mistake. 
you find yourself exhausted, worn out, just beat down, and you've used that as some kind of rationale to distance yourself a little bit from the Lord. The prayer is now infrequent. The time in God's word is non-existent, if at all existent whatsoever, and, 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 and things have changed. But this is the time that Jesus says, no. If you're exhausted, if you're worn down, come to me. Come to me. Draw closer to me, and I will draw closer to you, the scripture says. Can you say amen? Now, secondly, there's a responsibility. And this is very important. Take my yoke. Look at the verses, uh, 29 and 30. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find a rest for your souls. For my yoke, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. May I speak to the people here today who think that when you pray, you have absolved yourself from any responsibility whatsoever. Jesus says, come to me. Okay, good. Now, there's something for you to do. Wait a minute. I'm tired. What do you mean I got to take a yoke? I don't want a yoke. I want everything fixed. I want rest. I want strength. I want happy. I want pudding. I want everything great. And, and, and Jesus says, well, look, I, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do my part, but you got to do yours. Finding rest is actually not a passive thing. Finding rest comes when we do things Jesus' way. And so Jesus says, okay, all right, you've got a burden? All right, come to me. Good, glad you're here. Okay, take this. You serious, Jesus? Yep. Yep. Because... What I have for you, don't miss the last verse. What I have for you is easy and my burden for you is light. Jesus says, I'm not expecting you to do the hard stuff. I'll take care of that. But there's something that you have to do as well. Don't absolve yourself from the responsibility of still obeying what God wants you to do even when you're exhausted. Even when you're tired you still have responsibility. Third, there's a revelation that needs to take place. And this is the part of this scripture that a lot of people don't, they don't dwell on. Look at verse 29. He says, take my yoke upon you and, just three little words, learn from me. Now, in case you don't know what a yoke is, okay, Jesus is not serving eggs, okay? Here you see a couple of cows, oxen, and they're joined together by that piece of wood there and and all the straps and everything. That's called a yoke. And what's interesting about this setup, in fact, there was an old farmer that, that, he, he was still kind of plowing his fields kind of in a primitive way. Like if you go to Amish country, you'll see some of this as well, right? And you'll see like a couple of cows or oxen, whatever, and they're kind of plowing the field. It, it's real rustic, but it, it works. And a guy asked the farmer, hey, one of those cows seems to be bigger than the other a little bit or, or even older than the other. Why is that? And the farmer responded by saying, well, that large ox is the best one that I have. I have put a young ox with him so that he can learn from the older one how to do this job. If I were to turn the young ox by himself and just let him plow, he'd work himself to death. But because he is connected to the older Stronger, wiser ox, the young one learns and becomes really good at its craft because it was connected. 
So when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, what is he saying? I'll take the heavy load. You take the light load. And as we go through this together, I want you to learn from me. Don't miss this. If you're exhausted, could you ask yourself this question? What might God be saying to me today? What do I have to learn from you today, God? What are you trying to say to me? Listen, any prayer that Jesus answers for you will always be accompanied by a lesson to be learned. Lastly today, and I mean it this time, I'm closing. Some recognition that needs to take place. Verse 29, Jesus says, For I am gentle and humble in heart. But I isolated those first three words. For I am. For I am. As you're trying to get rest, and as you're trying to get strength, do you know what the Lord wants to do? He wants to reveal to you exactly who he is. Maybe that's not hitting you like it hit me. But sometimes we're so focused on getting the answer to our prayers that we don't realize that God will always use this opportunity for you to see his son for who he truly is. And in this case, he says, I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. Maybe your I am needs to be something different. Maybe you need it revealed that you have a very loving father, not a father who's out to get you. Maybe you need to be reminded that you have a great shepherd who's watching over you and taking care of you. Maybe you need to realize that he truly is the answer to everything that you've been searching for all of this time. What is God wanting to say to you personally throughout this whole experience? It's not just about getting rest. It's about Jesus revealing to you who he really is. And you will never find more strength and more peace and more stability than knowing exactly who Jesus is. I'm talking to people today, Jonathan, if you can help me. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people today that, that you've experienced life. You've experienced some trouble. You've experienced some good things, some bad things. But as things stand right now, there, there's just, you're at this place where you're just tired. You're exhausted. You're fatigued. You're worn out through no fault of your own. Life's happened to you. People have happened to you. Things have taken place. Here's what Jesus says. Come to me. Come to me. Let me teach you. The burden I have for you to carry is way lighter than what you think it is. And I want you to see me for who I truly am. And maybe today, maybe today, in the midst of your fatigue, and maybe today, in the midst of what you're facing, you can come to the Savior and just say, Lord, I need rest. I need strength. I need peace. I need help. And he's here today. If it just come to him. Will you stand with me? God, I'm asking you today that you would work in people's hearts. Jesus, I'm asking that today we would walk in the peace that can only come from you. So Lord, I pray that you'd meet us right where we're at. Hallelujah. Friend, if you need Jesus just to give you rest, you need him to give you strength, you need him to do something in your life just to just take you to the next day, he's here.
Come to him. Come to him. You'll find rest. You'll find out who he really is. In fact, you'll discover that what he has for you to carry isn't nearly the load that you thought you'd have to carry. He'll take care of that. Today, it starts by coming to him. And when I say that, it starts by just praying, approaching him and saying, Jesus, will you give me rest? Jesus, I got to sort some things out in my life. Will you help me? Jesus, I need, I need to be able to navigate life a lot better than what I'm doing right now. Will you help me? And he will give you rest. So here's how we're going to close. I'm going to give you a chance to find that rest. And that could be you coming to an altar and praying. It could be you just praying at your seat. But we're going to make this whole room a place of prayer. And I want to encourage you to come to him. Come to him and get rest. And then walk out of here with strength and the life and the hope that only he can provide for you. And when you're finished with God today, you can consider yourself dismissed to fellowship in the lobby. But right now, I got a feeling that there are a lot of us that need to spend some time talking to the one who will give us rest like no other. So Jesus, I'm asking you now, in the midst of life, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of trials, in the midst of just trying to serve you, Lord God, some of us find us ourselves at a, at a weak point. We need your strength. We need your strength. So Jesus, I pray that you would bring rest and strength and hope to those that need it. We come to you. We no longer go anywhere else before we go to you. Meet us, I pray, Lord. God, I'll thank you for the strength that you give us. And it's in your precious name that we ask this. Amen. If you need to pray, do so right now. If God's released you, you can consider yourself dismissed. God bless.